So we finished repair, right? And we were just ready to start on um, the different techniques for detecting and isolating mutants. So we can do this directly, or sometimes we have to do it indirectly, depending on the mutation. So um, the transformation that I was talking to you guys about last time, do you guys remember how I directly selected for the mutants? All right, so I talked about transposition in the lab. We talked about it a while ago, so it's back here, right? This example here. Yeah, where we can insert genes in. So how did I directly select for my mutants in this experiment? The answer's on the page. Yeah, Antibi I gave them antibiotic resistance. So therefore, if, they're re if the mutants are, are, you know, the ones that I've genetically changed, so you can call them mutants, right? If they're resistant to antibiotics, if I grow them in the presence of antibiotics, I'm only going to get my mutants, right? So I'm going to directly select for the mutants in that case. Make sense? Only the mutants grow because they're antibiotic resistant, and I grow them in the presence of antibiotics. So if you do something like that, where you can directly select, obviously that's nice and easy, right? Mm -hmm. And antibiotic resistance is a very common way to do direct selection. So here, right, looking at the bacteria, you can't tell one from another. But if you have ones that are resistant to antibiotics, then they're going to grow in the presence of the antibiotics, only those resistant ones, where without the antibiotics, the only reason you know one from the other is because they marked it. But in truth, right, it would not be color-coded like this. This is just for diagram purposes. Direct selection means you can directly select for just your mutant. Nothing else grows. So in the case of antibiotic resistance, only your mutant should grow, only the one that is resistant to the antibiotics. Is that always possible? No, right? A likelihood, right? Unless in the case of the of using transposal elements, right? If we genetically modify and we specifically give them that. But sometimes, you know, we're doing mut mutations where we can't directly select. And where that mutation would actually maybe put that mutant at a disadvantage such that if we put it in a presser situation, it doesn't grow. So, okay, you kill it off, right? Whew, I wanted to study that mutant, though, and I just killed it, right? So how am I going to keep it? How am I going to identify it without killing it? But to be able to identify, I've got to probably kill. So I probably need to replicate, right, our situation in two different environments. So imagine all these bacteria, right? We've got some mutants here like it's shown here. And we grow them on a plate. And notice in this case, only these guys grew, but we're going to have the reverse happen. We're going to have all the ones that are okay grow, and the mutant is going to get killed. And then on our other plate, all of them are going to be growing, but again, we're not going to know one from the other. So how do we tell the difference? So I don't know, there's some weird TV pro program recently, like flipping the channels on some crappy night where nothing's on TV. And it was some competition. And they had all these squares on two boards, these color squares. And this genius guy who can, like, he looks at code, like um, computer code, and he can look at the two codes and see the difference, like some little slight thing off. So they had like, an insane number of colored squares, right, in this random pattern on two different boards. And the girl switched three squares. 
without him seeing. And then he stood there and looked at the two and was able to pick out the three that were different on the other side. Yeah. But that's because, again, you had two boards, right? You had basically two copies, but one of them had something that was a miss from the other. You see what I mean? So could we do that with bacteria? Yeah. It's called replicator. Repli ah, replicate plating. I'm all right. <sighs> so, if you have bacteria growing on a petri dish and you pick up bacteria from that petri dish and you stamp them onto two other petri dishes, so two different environments in the exact same orientation. So notice there's a line on this plate, a line on this plate. This plate is covered in sterile felt. What do you know about felt? What does it feel like? It's fuzzy, right? So like the little fibers are sticking up, right? And they pick up a little bit of each one of these cells in the orientation that they these colonies are on this plate. So you basically use it as a stamp. And so in the same orientation, notice the line and the line, you line them up. You're going to stamp the bacteria in the same locations on both plates. But the two plates are two totally different environments. This environment here is lacking a nutrient that the mutant can't produce on its own. So guess what happens to it because it's a necessary nutrient? It dies. It dies. So notice there's a spot here that's empty that's not empty on this other plate. So we just discovered by this plate that these cells have mutated. They can't survive in this environment because we didn't provide them all the food necessary to survive. But in this plate, we provided all the food, right? It's a complex media. We'll talk about that in our next lecture. So everybody grows, mutant, non-mutant. But again, we can't tell because mutation happens where? In the genome, right? And it's going to affect what they can do, their phenotype right, what the physical expression is. Again, this is all molecular when it comes to bacteria for the most part, right? We're not talking about blue hair, blue eyes and curly hair here, right, when it comes to bacteria. We're talking about, you know, down at the molecular level, different abilities, like can it digest lactose? Can it synthesize the necessary um, nutrients it needs from the food we give it? So in this case, because we replica plated it, we did two copies of the exact same stuff, we can find our still living on this other plate mutant to be able to select it and study it. And again, this is a lot of trial and error still because depending on how you generated this mutation and you know, so many other factors um, will help determine you know, what media, what food, what environments you would put them in to select for and find your mutants. So sometimes we can directly select, like with antibiotic um, resistance. Sometimes we have to indirectly um, select, like you see here with replica plating. The Ames test This is for the identification of potential mutagens. So again, we're going to use bacteria to see if the chemicals, or say a drug that a drug company wants to use, has the ability to mutate, change DNA. But for the Ames test, we start out with an already mutated strain of bacteria. This mutation does not allow them to grow without the amino acid histidine. So under normal conditions, very few of them revert back to the wild type and are able to survive without histidine. So you'll get a few colonies that grow in your control. 
your test sample, you have two possibilities. You can have where not a lot of mutation happens, just the normal um, rate of just a few. Or if there's a lot of mutation that happens to the DNA, a lot of them mutate and have the ability to go back to the wild type form and are able to grow. So this one is sometimes hard for people to grasp, right? Because we're actually starting with a mutant. But this is a, a mutation that they know about, right? And they know the likelihood of other mutations causing it to revert back to the wild type. The important take-home message here is that, you know, especially for drug trials and such like that, or chemicals that they may want to put into our foods, we could test it on bacteria, and obviously, right, if it causes mutation, are we going to put it into production? Not, right? But if it doesn't cause mutation in the Ames test, does that mean they're going to put it on our supermarket shelves or in our drugstores? No. The FDA still has where it has to go through um, animal testing. Yeah, the cute and fuzzies. But there's new technology that people are trying to develop, too, where we're actually doing human cells, human, quote-unquote, organs in Petri dishes to test the effects drugs and chemicals have on human cells as opposed to animal cells. Because that's the other problem. Other than pigs, y'all, we're not a rat, right? Rats and guinea pigs and rabbits and, and some of these animals that they will test on, it may be okay for them, but it may still cause a reaction for us, right? Because we are, even though we're animals, we are distinctly different from them. Um, Right. And again, you know, that's the question is which life is more precious to you? A human life or an animal life? But maybe we can get to the level where it's human cells in a petri dish. Because nobody gets upset about the bacteria getting tortured, y'all. I don't hear anybody complaining about that. <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah, right? So, um, but, you know, I mean, this was a pretty huge technological advance in its time as well. You know, to be able to, you know, see if stuff is mutating bacteria. And so, therefore, there's the potential it may mutate us, right? And it would be definitely something we wouldn't want to put in our food or take as a drug. Make sense? Mm-hmm. So, back to the wild type, it's mm -hmm. used to get the mutation well. Yeah. Um, so, yes, good question. She, so she said, if it mutates, um, then it's carcinogenic. Not always. But the likelihood, if it's a mutagen, if it's mutating your DNA, there's the potential it could be a carcinogen, which means that it mutates in such a way that the cells become cancerous, behaving badly cells. Yeah, because I think, yeah, yeah. So it's a common test, chemical test for carcinogens which are mutagens, right? Um, carcinogens are things that mutate your DNA and, and therefore um, can, can lead to cancer. Not everything that is a mutagen can be a carcinogen, though, right? But it can be bad news anyway. And that's our greatest fear, right, that we mutate to the level of... Um, of cancer. Okay, so moving on. So our next set of objectives um, deal with horizontal or um, lateral gene transfer. So what we've been talking about so far is vertical, right? When we have a mutation in the DNA and it, it doesn't get fixed and it gets passed on to the next generation, right? and all the different ways in which that can happen. With horizontal gene transfer, this is where gene, genetic information is moving from one organism to another. Okay, 
So we're not talking about, you know, a cell dividing and passing it on to a prodigy. We're talking about a cell giving it to, say, their cousin. And there are three main ways in which this can happen. Conjugation, transformation, and transduction. So we're going to look at these methods, their similarities and their differences, and the outline the processes in which they happen. Transformation was actually discovered by who? Yeah, Frederick Griffith. in 1929 and he wasn't actually trying to discover transformation he was trying to develop a vaccine but we'll back up for a minute All right so here's our three mechanisms as I said DNA mediated transformation or sometimes just referred to as transformation transduction and conjugation so all our examples are horizontal or gene transfer horizontal or lateral gene transfer Vertical gene transfer, remember, is what? Mother to the prodigy, right? Direct lineage. But genetic information can move around, too. So a spontaneous mutation that may occur and be passed on vertically could then maybe be passed on horizontally. And something horizontally once it's passed on horizontally, could then be passed on vertically. So this, this stuff moves around. It doesn't stay put. But vertical means from mom to siblings. Horizontal, right, jumping literally from one cell to another. How it gets there is either transformation, transduction, or conjugation. And in this case, they're showing a small per circular piece of DNA, what we refer to as a plasmid moving. But information can move from the chromosome. But one of the most common, most portable forms of DNA are plasmids, because they're circular, closed, smaller pieces of DNA as opposed to the chromosome. So they're, they're much more mobile um, than chromosomes because they're so much smaller. So as I said, Frederick Griffin in 1928, he was working with Streptococcus pneumoniae. And in this, he found that naked DNA, DNA all by itself, was moving from one bacteria to another. So as I said, he was trying to develop a vaccine, right? And he found with growing Streptococcus pneumoniae in artificial culture, he had two cell types. He had one that was shiny and smooth, and come to find out it had a capsule. It was encapsulated. And that was the pathogenic feature. This was the feature that made the, the mice die of pneumonia uh, because this capsule helps the bacteria adhere to us and also helps hide it from phagocytosis, destruction by our white blood cells. So when you give the living encapsulated form of Streptococcus pneumoniae, the mouse dies of pneumonia. He also found that there was another strain that would grow that wasn't shiny, it was kind of rough, and the cells lacked a capsule. When he gave these living cells to the mice, they did not succumb to infection. Their immune system, because it wasn't encapsulated, was able to recognize these bacteria and eliminate them um, before serious infection ensued in death. So they were able to fight the infection. So another thing that he did and that was common was to heat kill the bacteria. So he heat killed the encapsulated ones, the ones that actually made the mouse sick. And of course, these are dead bacteria, so are they going to make the mouse sick? No, right? So I don't know why, but you get the brainiac idea of, well, these two things don't kill the mice, so if I put these two things together, I'll probably make a really good vaccine, right? Know what happened to the poor mouse? He's dead. 
What did he autopsy back out of the mouse? Live encapsulated bacteria. That's not what he put in, is it? No. How does a bacteria know how to make a capsule? Where is that information encoded? In the DNA. But these living ones don't know how to make it, right? Do these dead cells know how to make it? Yeah, because it's in their DNA. Guess what happens to their DNA when they're dead? It escapes. It escapes. It becomes part of the environment. Right? You just put, basically, DNA in this mouse, along with living bacterial cells under a stressful condition. They saw the bacteria, the, I mean, they saw the DNA from the dead bacteria, picked it up, and used it. Used it to now learn how to make a capsule. Oops. <laughs> right? So, of course, his question was like, how the heck did this happen? <laughs> right? This is not what I expected to happen. How did this happen? So, when bacteria die, their DNA becomes part of the environment, right? So, this bacteria is dead, it's DNA is shooting out of its cell. It's rupturing out of the cell. So the donor in transformation dies, and its DNA becomes part of the environment. This can be picked up by other bacterial cells and utilized, right, to be able to do new and wonderful things as far as they're concerned. They don't always do this, though. They do this under certain conditions. Um, and they had receptors on their surface for DNA in the environment, though. And under certain circumstances, they're going to pick up DNA if it's there and see if they can utilize it. So we're going to go through the process. I'm going to go ahead and play this animation. I got the one to play this morning for my other class, so I know this will work. DNA transformation involves the transfer of naked DNA into a recipient cell. In the first step, double-stranded donor DNA binds to specific receptors on the surface of a competent cell. One strand of the donor DNA is degraded by nucleases while the other strand enters the cell. The single-stranded donor DNA pairs with an homologous region on the recipient DNA and is integrated into the recipient genome by a breakage and reunion mechanism called homologous recombination. If there are any differences between the nucleotide sequences of the donor and recipient DNAs, the mismatch repair system comes into play. The repair system removes either the donor or the recipient strand and replaces it with the complementary sequence. Since either strand may be repaired, some cells contain the new donor DNA and others have the original DNA sequences. In the laboratory, cells are plated on selective media so that only the transformants will grow. So, um, I think, I forget when we're doing this one. It is towards the end of the semester in lab, in microbiology lab. We'll actually do a transformation. Um, we'll take DNA, but we're going to take it in the form of a plasmid. Um, and we're going to stick it in the test tube with some bacteria. And these are special bacteria that are super competent. And that's the term that we use um, for cells that are in this state where they're going to take up the DNA. So these guys have been made um, as a special strain of E. coli that we work with. And then we're going to put them in an environment that's going to make their membranes more permeable. And then we're going to introduce DNA in the form of a plasmid into the test tube, so in their environment. And they're going to take up that DNA. And because of that, they're going to become transformed. They're only truly transformed as they actually take in the DNA and keep it and utilize it. So notice here, this guy is not transformed. It didn't actually choose to keep the DNA it brought in. It has to keep it in order to truly be transformed. 
And then, of course, it can pass it on vertically to its prodigy. Right, so all of its descendants have now this information. So in this case, they talked about antibiotic resistance. And so that, again, makes it very easy to select for your ones that you've transformed. And we will do this in the microbiology lab, too. We're going to give them antibiotic resistance. And we'll grow them in the presence of the antibiotics. So only our transformed cells will grow. We're also going to give them genetic information on how to make a protein called green fluorescent protein. That when you shine UV light on them, they'll fluoresce green. So we're going to make green fluorescent E. coli. And you're like, oh, wow, that's fun. What's the purpose of that? Right? There is more of a scientific purpose to doing something like that. Um, fluorescent proteins are used a lot nowadays in research uh, to be able to label things. Right? So if, if something is green, right, you can track it, you can follow it. And so my favorite one that always makes everybody pay attention, I mean, I'm going to steal it from my lab class for you guys. A little preview for those of you guys in the lab. I think it's 12. Yeah. So somebody had fun, right? But even at, you know, a larger organism level, right, they've colored them. But this is my favorite one. Let's see if I can get it open. It's a very, oh. Yeah, go ahead. Ah, uh, see? I'm telling you, the internet is not happy today in this room. Might not be able to go. I should have just copied the link. Well, think about this. So, it clearly worked in these two mice because they're glowing green. Mm -hmm. Now, they didn't just give them green for us a protein. They probably gave them something else genetically that they want to test. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't always work. But they can tell it worked here because the ones that have been genetically modified are glowing green. Because it's tough to do it at the organism at the organismal level, the organism level. Although it's been done a lot. So this one is fruit fly sperm. Can you see them? You can really see the green ones, right? So these are fruit fly sperm under the microscope in the reproductive tract of the female. Now look closely. Do you see the red ones? So female fruit flies will mate with more than one male because she wants her offspring to be diverse. And if they're diverse, they're more likely to survive in the environment, right? So they've found, because what they did is one of the fruit fly males, they made his sperm green and the other fruit fly red. And they found by observing under the microscope, the sperm actually compete with each other. They compete with each other. And we would have never known that the different sperm compete if we hadn't labeled one guy green and one guy red, right? Because otherwise we couldn't tell one from the other. Yeah, no, they're, they're trying, they're, like, well, this video doesn't really show it. There, there are more. Um, but, like, where they'll, they try to get to it, the eggs first or try to block the others. Um, but they also found they did additional testing because, again, why does the female fruit fly mate with one more than one male? She wants diverse babies. So she actually wants some of each one of the guy's sperm to win, right? So her chemicals in her reproductive tract tries to diminish the competitiveness of the sperm. Kind of cool stuff. But again, we wouldn't even begin to scratch the surface if we hadn't been able to genetically modify and literally be able to detect one male sperm from the other to see that this competition was happening. So this, is, this type of modification has been used a lot. Um, and this... These fluorescent proteins are actually um, normal proteins that exist in nature in jellyfish. So again, they just took that code on how to make these proteins. 
and have put it into anything you can probably imagine nowadays, including bacteria, of course, to be able to label them. So we can, you know, study things like this. So there's a, there's a real world example of transformation. But this happens in nature because, again, they could pick up something beneficial like how to make a capsule. Now the next one is, here, let me go back to my, the next one is transduction. So notice both these words start with trans, right? One's transformation, the next one is transduction. So trans, again, is the movement, the transport of information. And I always remember, as we were talking about earlier, transformers, right? My son is convinced someone is driving that a Camaro around the city that looks like Bumblebee, the transformer Bumblebee. My son, who's eight, is convinced it's going to turn into a robot. I'm trying to explain to him that that's make-believe. But who knows, someday that might really freaking happen, right? And then he's going to go, Mommy, you told me that couldn't happen. At the time, it couldn't happen. It was make believe, okay. But you know that that you know that's a pretty big transformation, right? From a car to a robot, you know. Um, but you know, big changes can happen with information like DNA, right? So imagine, right? Think of transformation. If it helps, think of transformers. Think of how you can change dramatically. But the key here is with the information, which is DNA. So the next one, transduction. So what I want you to focus in on in this word is the duct. And a duct is a conduit that stuff moves through, right? A vessel, right, is a duct. Stuff moves through it. So the conduit, the duct, in this case, anyone know what it is? What's going to carry the DNA from one bacteria to another? A bacterial virus. So here it is right here, right? What we call a bacterial phage or phage for short. So here is the virus, right? The protein coat with the nucleic acid on the inside. This is the duct. This is the vehicle that's going to move the DNA from one bacteria to another. In generalized transduction, a segment of DNA is carried from one bacterial cell to another by a bacterial virus called a bacteriophage, or phage. The phage attaches to the bacterial cell and injects its nucleic acid into the host cell. A phage enzyme is produced that breaks down the host DNA into smaller fragments. Phage DNA is replicated and phage coat proteins are produced. During formation of the mature phage particles, a few phage heads may surround fragments of bacterial DNA instead of phage DNA. The phage particle carrying the bacterial DNA infects another cell, transferring the bacterial DNA to the new cell. When the bacterial DNA is introduced into the new host cell, it can become integrated into the bacterial chromosome, thereby transferring genes to the recipient. This cell then multiplies and carries new genetic material. Pretty cool, huh? Guess what happens? Doesn't happen just in bacteria nowadays. They've actually found that viruses that infect the algae in our oceans are actually what are transmitting pigment proteins from different algae to each other, right? So the viruses are accidentally picking up the DNA on how to make a particular pigment protein that allows them to absorb light, and that's how it's moving from different algae in our oceans. It's, trans, it's transduction, right? So, but this happens in, in bacteria too. Um, as to the rate and how, you know, there, there's different things. And then they said this was generalized, right? Um, there's specific forms where only specific genes are, can be picked up or are likely to be picked up. So we can get into the real nitty-gritty with this, but we're going to keep it at the basic level, right?
So at the very basic level, right, a cell gets infected by a bacterial virus, by a phage. That virus, of course, takes over that cell, and it now becomes a virus-making factory. But for some reason, some of the capsids, the protein coats for the virus, pick up bacterial DNA instead of the viral DNA. And so now this virus does like it always would, goes and attaches to another cell. Except now what it's injecting in is bacterial DNA and not viral. So its life cycle, that virus, just ended. It basically was just used as a free ride for some DNA. And now, again, if that bacteria keeps that DNA, it has now changed. It has been transduced. And so in research, this is another active area. It's like, how can we use this to our benefit? So scientists have even, you know, this happens in nature, but how can we use it to our benefit? And anybody know or think like, wow, this is pretty cool, right? We can use a virus. How would that, how can, how would that be beneficial for humans? Like, can we use viruses like this? Can we trick them to do our bidding? Yeah, they're, they're actively working on this, right? Where we could use viruses to inject good DNA to replace bad DNA in cells, or even use viruses, right? So we're using their protein coat, maybe even their envelope, but inside we have what we want delivered, like a drug, maybe, to a particular cell. That virus only goes and attaches to the receptors on those cells, so therefore only delivers the drug to those cells. So they're engineering and they're working with this kind of stuff nowadays, of like basically using viruses to our benefit. So the next is conjugation. Again, we're going to focus in on transferring a plasmid. That's the easiest thing to transfer. Um, but conjugation can transfer pieces of chromosomes and such as that. But we're going to keep it on the simplistic level, and we're going to stick to just um, plasmid transfer. Conjugation is a mechanism of gene transfer that requires direct contact between donor and recipient cells. A plasmid is a small piece of DNA, separate from the main chromosome, that carries genetic information for such things as antibiotic resistance. The first step in plasmid transfer is contact between the donor and the recipient. The pillus of the donor cell recognizes and binds to specific receptor sites on the cell wall of the recipient cell. The plasmid then becomes mobilized for transfer when an enzyme leaves one strand of the plasmid at a specific nucleotide sequence called the origin of transfer. A single strand of the plasmid, beginning at the origin of transfer, enters the recipient cell. Once inside the recipient cell, a complementary strand to the single DNA strand is synthesized. When donor and recipient cells are mixed together, eventually all of the cells become donors. Okay. This is the one where the donor gets to live. Yay! The first one, it died, right? And its DNA became part of the environment. That's transformation. Transduction, what happened to the donor? Yeah, by what? A virus. So it died from a viral infection. The first one, it doesn't really matter how it died, but it died. That's how its information became part of the environment for transformation. Transduction, a virus got it. And in this case, though, in conjugation, is sometimes referred to as bacterial sex. Because again, all sex is is an exchange of genetic information. And in this case, when the donor 
um, transmitted, does not die. Right? And these cells physically contact each other just like people have to do when, as it relates to sex. You have to have that direct contact to transfer the information. Now, there's some terminology that's related to conjugation. So F stands for fertility. So there are some plasmids that in addition to information on them, they have the information on how to make the sex papillus. So they are very readily um, passed on via conjugation. A cell that has this is referred to as an F positive cell. A cell that does not have it is referred to as an F, F negative and can become a recipient cell. Of course, once the cells join and the information is passed to the recipient, the recipient now is F positive and can become a donor cell. And the previous donor cell can continue to donate to other recipients. So basically what happens is not much unlike a sexually transmitted disease, that you put one E. coli in a test tube with a bunch of his friends, with this ability he will give it to all of his friends. Right? They're going to just keep passing it until all the cells in that test tube have passed the plasmid on to each other. The frightening thing about this, especially with it being a plasmid and easily transferred from cell to cell, and before we answer that, what's, what's some of the differences between the plasmids versus the chromosome? I've already mentioned some of these. Plasmids are smaller than chromosomes. They travel easy. They code for non-essential information usually, right? So does a cell have to have a plasmid? No. But usually it's advantageous. They occur in far more copies inside of the cell than the chromosome. Why? We're not exactly sure. Uh, but, you know, you could stand to reason that the more copies you have of something, the more you could utilize it and the more stuff you could make, right? So if I gave you guys an assignment and I only handed three copies of the assignment out to this room, that would really slow you guys down in completing the assignment because you wouldn't have as much access to the information, right? As opposed to if I gave everybody a copy, so just like in the cell, if they've got, you know, 20 copies of the plasmid, then, you know, 20 enzymes can attach and they can start copying that information and utilizing it much faster than if they have a single copy. And because remember, uh, bacteria for the most part are haploid as far as their chromosome goes. They just have one copy of their genetic information. But plasmids, they can keep lots of copies in their cell. Where if they copy their chromosome, it's usually because the cell's getting ready to divide. So the more copies they have, right, the quicker they can use that information. And this information tends to not have to be related. So the bacteria that, that transfer this don't necessarily have to be related to each other. So the question is to E. coli. There's a strain of E. coli known as E. coli 0157. Um, or it's referred to as sugar toxin E. coli. It has the ability to make this toxin known as the sugar toxin. This toxin gets its name from the organism it was first discovered in, and that is Shigella. Shigella, that bacteria, causes a really bad form of um, diarrhea, intestinal infection, because this toxin literally will kill your epithelial cells lining your intestines. This is a really serious toxin. Well, how the heck did the Shiga toxin from Shigella get into E. coli? Okay. 
Yeah, uh, I don't know if it's plasmid, if it's a plasmid encoded, but it's definitely DNA, right? Is how those cells know how to make the sugar toxin. E. coli and shigella mm, may be cousins, right? So how did it probably get there? It might have got there by transformation, right? A shigella died near an E. coli, the E. coli picked it up, and now that strain passed it on to all its prodigy. What's another way it could have got there? Transduction or could have been conjugation. But clearly, right, it originated from Shigella. Not all E. coli have it, right? Just this one strain that picked it up. Even more scary than the Shiga toxin are what we refer to as resistance plasmids, or R plasmids for short. These are plasmids that contain genetic information on how to be resistant to antibiotics. So this is the really frightening thing, right? If they can conjugate and give this to their friends. Right? If they get transduced or by transformation. And again, plasmids are smaller, they're compact, they're easily transferred to unrelated cells even. Great news for the bacteria, right? In this antibiotic world, they get to live. Bad news for us, for when we want to kill the pathogenic ones. Our weapon doesn't work. They're immune. They're resistant because of this information. Now, it may be information on how to make a different ribosome so that the antibiotic doesn't bind, or how to make an enzyme that digests the antibiotic when it comes into the cell. There's lots of different ways that they can become resistant. Um, they can stop the uptake of the antibiotic. Antibiotics have to get into the cell to interfere with cellular processes. So some of them, you know, have changed their membrane proteins and, and the antibiotic just can't get in. Some of them, you know, have mechanisms where they'll, it'll come in and they recognize it and they kick it back out. It's like bailing a boat. They're like, oh, no, no, that's bad stuff. <laughs> out you go. You can't stay in here. So there's different ways in which they become resistant. The bad news is that they are resistant. So that's it for genetics, although that's quite a bit, right? Yes. You're like, okay, I'm good with that. Kind of understand why Ms. Erica covered this first in the unit, and we'll cover the easy stuff next.